Good evening and thank you for everyone for attending tonight. Um, I've called this uh, specific um, uh, uh, presentation uh, Gawler Sporting Intelligence. Now, if anyone's done any research, I'll know in the 1800s, uh, when anything's written under sport, it was always called Sporting Intelligence, which uh, kind of makes you figure you had to be pretty smart to play back in those days. Uh, and I'm sort of looking at around today and there's uh, quite a few sporting people here that have been involved in Gawler. We have uh, uh, Peter Jones, who's a racing trainer. We've got Tom Zoyke, got the uh, first kick and leg football at Football Park. We've got Robert Maholan, who uh, kicked six goals in the first semi when Central's won their first final. We've got uh, Sean Carlin, who uh, uh, Commonwealth gold medalist. Uh, we've got uh, Alfie Skews, played in all, all three Gawler teams. Uh, won male medals with Central and Williston and won the uh, Bay Sheffield uh, run. And he's a prominent uh, indoor bowler nowadays, I believe. So. Uh, so we've got quite a few, and I'm sure there's other ones that I've uh, missed. I thought there was going to be a Sheffield Shield cricketer here as well, uh, uh, Rick Drew, but obviously he hasn't made it. Uh, but that's fine. Um, what I'd like to sort of start off with first is uh, talk about football. Uh, I'm going to talk about a, a number of different sports and a number of different people, but we'll start off with football. And in Gawler, the first mention of football was in uh, 1868, and an advert in the... Uh, in the bunyip, uh, looking for any person's uh, desire of joining the above club can do so by attending the next meeting. So that was uh, in 1868, and for those Port Adelaide fans, where Port Adelaide say they're the oldest club in South Australia, one of the oldest clubs, uh, we can make a connection with the Gawler Club through the Central District, which started out of the Gawler Association. Um, they can probably claim to be older than Port Adelaide. And in fact, in 1874, uh, there was a, a game between Port Adelaide and Gawler. Now, in uh, 1874, Port Adelaide was uh, five years old, and then their, their historian made a claim that before 1877, when uh, Port joined the, uh, the South Australian Football Association, which became the SNFL, that they'd never lost a game up to that stage, but Gawler beat them two goals to nil back in the, uh, back in the day. So that was, uh, that was a pretty pleasing piece of... Uh, historic information that I dug up many years ago and uh, it, it gave me a lot of pleasure whenever I spoke to Port supporters. Apologies to all Port supporters here, but uh, we're in Central's area here, so uh, you'll have to put up with that. Uh, and then sort of like uh, going on from there, uh, the Gawler team actually joined the SAFA, the, the South Australian National Football League for what it was called at the time, in uh, 1887 and they played their four seasons. And they found that they weren't getting enough practice games. So they, uh, they formed a, um, uh, the Gawler Junior Football League, which became the Gawler League, with three teams, uh, South Gawler, Williston and Gawler Central, in 1889. And of course, those clubs celebrated the centenary in the, uh, 1989. But in uh, my research, I found South Gawler and Williston were actually playing football in Gawler in, from 1886. 85, 86, 87, before the, the Gawler Football League had started. And at times, Williston South Gawler would amalgamate to play the Gawler team that played in town. Can you imagine those two clubs sort of amalgamating today? <laughs> sort of it's, uh, it's, a, it's unbelievable. So it gave me a lot of pleasure to find that little bit of history, and I, I brought it to the attention of the clubs, and, and they were quite uh, taken by it. None of those, their historians have sort of been aware of any of that early football, and... Um, it, sort of, uh, it always gives me a great pleasure to uh, find those types of uh, information. It's uh, those little pieces of gold, and if people are family historians, they know what I'm talking about. When you find that long-lost great-great-great-grandfather, it's a little bit like that. And, uh, and uh, of course, with family historians, sports plays a big part uh, with them as well. So uh, it's, it's, it gives me a lot of uh, pleasure when I find those little nuggets of gold. And then when we sort of go on a little bit uh, with this, the league team, uh, they went for four years, and by the fourth year they were struggling a little bit because the allied teams wouldn't come down to Gawler anymore to play. Uh, they said it was too far. Uh, well, hang on, Gawler had to travel just as far when they're playing town. Uh, but the, we also had a little problem on the Gawler Oval. Uh, there was actually a telegraph pole in the middle of the ground. And, um, and that's uh, a cartoon that Peter Bowman did for us, which was in this... Uh, this book, Palms to Premiers, which was a history of central districts, and it's got lots of Gawler, sort of early Gawler football history in that book, where I got a little bit of the information from 
for tonight. So uh, the Gawler, uh, the Gawler team in the in the state league after four seasons, no more. It didn't sort of uh, get back in until Central Districts arrived in uh, in 1959. Although there were overtures for South Gawler Footy Club, we played in the 20s and they were a powerful club. They virtually won all the premierships. Um, there was overtures for them joining the league back in the, in the early 30s, but it, it didn't eventuate, so we had to wait till uh, a lot of the Gawler teams uh, formed Central Districts in uh, 1959. So uh, so we eventually got our team in Cyberth for Elizabeth, which became the, uh, the new suburb sort of north of LA. Now, when we look at the early history of the Gawler Football League, uh, there was a very interesting snippet that I discovered from uh, 1893. Uh, you look at all the records and Gawler Central won the flag. Uh, and I was going through the records and looking at them year by year and I couldn't work it out um, why South Gawler hadn't won the premiership because um, uh, as it turned out they, um, they missed two games against Williston who were the bottom team and uh, it was because there was a death in the club at Williston so they postponed these two games. So at the end of the season Gawler Central played two more games and won two more games. But then a couple of weeks later, South Gawler played them catch-up games and they won both of them, which left them equal with Central. And uh, Gawler Central challenged them to a, a grand final, so or a playoff for the Premiership. But the cricket season had already started, so they never played the game. So in the, uh, over the years, the, uh, the Bunyip newspaper, which uh, had a, a Gawler Central type learning with uh, the Barnett family, uh, William Barnett and his son were... Uh, members of the Gawler Central Club, and um, and it was always written up that Gawler Central won the flag. But looking at the research in the uh, annual report for that season, it says that South and uh, and uh, Gawler Central shared the premiership. So we discovered a uh, an extra premiership for South Gawler, which happened to put them to 37 flags instead of 36 as the most successful club in Gawler. So that was a little bit of an interesting uh, aspect about um, about looking up the history. Now, just going on a, a little bit, we've got, um, uh, that's the South Gawler team from 1893, who uh, they're actually premiers, and they knew they were premiers at the time, but they weren't recognised until, uh, until I sort of dug that up and wrote that story about 10 years ago or thereabouts. Then later on, through my work in the Bunyip, um, uh, we wanted to recognise uh, the team of the century for Gawler football uh, uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, and uh, what I did with that is I got... Um, people on the committees for Gawler Central South and Williston together and we nutted through all their best players over history and we come up with this uh, uh, Gawler uh, Team of the Century. If anyone's interested, here's a, a copy of it. If you want to pass it around and have a look at the, the players that sort of in that team, you're quite welcome to have a look. So uh, sort of the, the fact is that Gawler football's that old that we managed to have a Team of the Century, which uh, a lot of league clubs didn't even have that. So. Uh, uh, Gawler can be very uh, proud of their football over the years. <laughs> now, uh, going on. Uh, this is our excuse that we spoke about uh, previously, who uh, played for all the three Gawler clubs and uh, won the two male medals. And did you play in any premiership teams, Alf? Yes. How many did you play? Which clubs? Oh, we were still in the premiership. Yeah. yeah. Um, I played for a number of other teams. I played for this one. Yeah. And of course, in 1964 with South Adelaide, which yeah. was their most recent premiership. Yeah. So, uh, well done, Alfie. And of course, uh, the AFL sort of uh, come upon the scene in 1990, and uh, this is Williston Oval, and uh, this is um, where Port Power played. Um, uh, Western Sydney Giants in um, uh, 2010 and um, that's amazing that we actually had AFL football played here in Gore so um, uh, it's, it just shows you sort of how prominent uh, Gore is with their football now this is uh, Brad Symes who uh, is a local boy his, his father was actually in the uh, Peter Symes was in the uh, team of the year for um, team of the century for Gore uh, this is in the 2007 Grand Final where Port Adelaide played Geelong. Does anyone know the result of that game? No, Geelong won by a record 119 points. 
So uh, they didn't quite beat the Central District's uh, 125 points in 2004, but uh, but Brad said that, that was his last game for Port Adelaide. Then he went to the Crows, and of course uh, he um, played in a couple of premierships with Central District, and he won the McGarry Medal. So um, he's one of um, a few sort of Gawler people that played in the AFL. Sam Butler from South Gawler is another one. And of course, in the early days, a lot of the Williston and Central and South boys played in the SNFL. Now, tradition uh, over the last five years or six, seven years, Anzac Day is always special with the Gawler teams. And there's always uh, matches uh, on the 25th of uh, April where um, the, uh, the teams sort of play off for uh, an Anzac Day Cup and it's uh, well received. And of course, in uh, 2014, Anzac Day, Gawler Central and Williston, first night game. First official night game in the BMG, Gawler Oval. So that's... Um, and then, of course, like I said, a lot of, uh, a lot of local kids uh, have gone on and still play for Central Districts. This is uh, uh, Josh uh, Waldharder from Williston, who happens to be your, uh, your daughter's boyfriend, I believe. He's also an arbitrator, arbit you know, an arbitrator, and he, uh, he deals with trees and... and uh, uh, when I took that photograph there, we got it for the football budget and uh, got the whispers over with the background with his uh, profession. So, uh, now, of course, with the, uh, the football, there's netball. And uh, netball's been a very uh, strong part of the, uh, the scene since uh, the Gawler teams entered the Boston Light and Gawler in uh, 1987. And uh, I use this particular photograph because uh, Williston... Uh, this particular year, they won the uh, Senior 1, Senior 2, Senior 4, 5 and 6 Premiership, which is unheard of. Five of the six Senior Premierships are uh, all won by Williston. And of course, they, they've been a power team over the last 10 years, but they're not doing so well sort of at the moment. So, uh, I wasn't sort of ready to go to that next slide, but that's okay. So, there's, uh, there's some football for you. Now, we're just going to talk about uh, some baseball now. From the, uh, from the Bunyip on December the 4th, 1885, the model school picnic. And uh, there's a quote in there about the youngsters were uh, distributed all over the ground, some swinging, some playing uh, cricket, some football, or baseball. That's the first mention of anyone playing baseball in South Australia. And it was in the Gawler Bunyip here in Gawler, which I think sort of is absolutely amazing. And then we go to this slide here. This is Sid Smith. He was born in Gawler. His father was a station master at, um, at the Gawler Railway Station. And uh, the significance about Sid is that there's a couple of interesting aspects about Sid. He, um, he went on and he went to, he represented the state in uh, 1896 and uh, he was chosen in the Australian baseball team in 1897 which toured America. So he, he went over to America with this team. There were 13 players and went from San Francisco to New York and right across the country and uh, and there's a little story about uh, he got injured and he went to London ahead of the team. They played one game in London before they came home. And apparently the manager absconded with all the funds, so some of them had to work their passage home. But Sid stayed in, uh, in London and um, he actually married in London. And he returned to South Australia in uh, 1912. And he's, uh, he'd become a very famous uh, soccer um, umpire and he umpired football. And... Uh, his interest in baseball continued and, and like I said, he played for South Australia. His son Don Smith played for South Australia in 1928 and then uh, his grandson Colin Worth played state baseball in the 50s and Colin Worth's uh, brother Alan's son uh, William Worth played under 14 state baseball and Colin's grandson uh, Simon Maslin played in that same team. So five generations of the one family played state baseball. They all started here in Gawler, which I think is really amazing. An amazing little story. Uh, the next photo is the Australian team, um, where Sid's the tall guy at the back in the middle, and there was one other South Australian in that team, and uh, that was Roo Ewers on the far left. Uh, very interesting story. There was uh, Frank Labor, who uh, was a uh, representative of Australian cricket, and there's half that team were cricketers, uh, you're going a bit quick for me. So, uh, no, 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 I'm going like this. <laughs> no, it's okay. Then, uh, in, before World War II, uh, there was baseball being started here in, uh, in Gore, and they played at various locations. And uh, 
Paul's dad Ken was playing baseball uh, for the uh, for the various teams that played, but with World War Two sort of uh, coming, uh, it never sort of went any further than that. And the next uh, interesting uh, story about baseball was uh, about 1985. There was a, a Gawler Bunyip team that played winter baseball for two years, and Ken's son Paul was played a game for the uh, the Gawler Bunyips. Remember that, Paul? We played together down there at Gawler High School. And so that lasted a couple of years, and um, and then um, in 2007, um, a friend of mine, Barry O'Brien, sort of uh, he was pushing me about starting a team in Gawler, and uh, we eventually did start a club, uh, the Gawler Rangers Baseball Club, and um, this was the uh, first game they ever played. Uh, we played at Northern Districts. We actually lost the game, but um, we've been five and since then, and. Uh, of course, with the uh, with the baseball, there's also at Carbethan, there's softball that's played, and uh, that's the Gawler District Softball Association, which has the Giants, a local team, with Kangas from the Barossa, and Two Wells, and Blue Jays, and it's, it's been going for quite a few years, and it, it's really popular. And because of the, uh, the baseball and the softball, we also have T-ball. And uh, there's a group of the T-ballers from a couple of years ago, all the teams were together, so it has become pretty popular, and of course baseball's close to my heart. Brian mentioned that I was a life member of the league, and uh, I've been involved in baseball a lot longer than my, how old my kids are. I've been forever playing baseball, and uh, don't play anymore, but uh, yeah, really love the game, so, uh, so it's, it's one sport that is very close to my heart. Now, one thing interesting, I, I do have a little bit of a passion to take photographs as well, and, um, and it's interesting that um, that uh, this year I was taking, I, I tell a lot of photographers where to best stand to take photos for baseball and things like that, and uh, this year something really freaky happened. I was uh, just taking a, a shot from behind, just sort of thinking, I just want to get an angle from behind, and, uh, and uh, next thing I know, oh, this big bang, crash. And the bat hit the uh, the wire fence just where I was standing, missed my camera, and it scooted off, didn't even hit me. And the, and the resulting shot was uh, this shot here. So uh, it did not hit me, but uh, uh, but that's how you know you can never set that up. You'll never take that shot again. But I just thought I'd throw that one in as a little bit of interest. Now uh, we'll sort of go on to a little bit of uh, cricket. Now. I don't know if anyone realises that in uh, 1880 there was a, a really interesting situation that occurred uh, in Gawler. The, um, the Australian cricket side was over in England playing the first test game in England in 1880. And the plan was that they'd come back and they'd play the South Australian team on their way back to Melbourne. So they arrived at Quinelg in November 1880 and they found out that the South Australian team was actually playing their first ever Sheffield Shield game, 11 versus 11 in Victoria. So they were over there in Victoria, and they started the match in Victoria the day after Ned Kelly was hung, which is just an absolutely amazing sort of statistic. And then uh, they tried to organise this game, so they contacted the Gawler Club, and uh, they said, yes, come down, but uh, they had to play at Power Power Mansion. So uh, Walter Duffield sort of put this coconut pitch down and the Australian team came here and played against a Northern Areas 22. And uh, that's sort of the, the test there. And uh, I was talking to a mate of mine and I gave him a photo, old photo of Power Power and a cricket game. And I asked him to uh, mock that up for me just, uh, just out of interest. And I reckon he's done a great job. That's Peter Bowman, who's a, a cartoonist. And um, so he did that for me. So I was really pleased. Now, a little bit about the, um, the actual game. Um, the, uh, <coughs> they played on a coconut uh, wicket and A. Bannerman and A. Jarvis opened for Australia. They were 8 for 192 at stumps and they scored another 31 runs a, on the Sunday uh, before the Northerners went in. And Fred Sp Spoffoff took 11 wickets with the local team all out for 69 runs and were 9 for 43 at the end of the second day. So you could say they got a bit of a spanking, even though they doubled the amount of players. Uh, Spoffoff took another five wickets on the second day. But on the Saturday night, the Australian players went to the Gawley Institute to see a play, the HMS Pinnacle, where there was a lot of kids were playing, in that um, a lot of kids were in the play, and they were 
when you look, read the names, it's a who's who of the names of the streets here in Gawler. A lot of the local sort of um, people that grew up to be mayors and and um, businessmen in the town were pl in that particular place. So it's sort of it's funny how it connects from uh, Ned Kelly right through to uh, to sort of all the local people. Now, going on to the next one. Now, this is a very strange story. This is about the Australian cricket captain, Joe Darling, who, uh, who for about two years was in Roseworthy College and played football and cricket here in Gawler. And the only reason sort of I'd sort of dug all this up is this uh, photograph is when he went to Manduru in 1893. And Joe's the one holding the football basically in the middle there. But where he's standing, you look two to the left, and that young chap there with his arms crossed is actually my great-grandfather um, who was uh, playing that team, and this was brought to my attention. And so the, when I sort of looked it up, I found out that this guy had actually played in Gawler, which was absolutely amazing. And sort of reading about sort of the exploits of what Joe had done was just unbelievable. And, and when he was playing uh, football for Gawler, it was their third season, they'd only won about five games in the other three seasons, but the season that Joe played for the second half, they won their last, four of their last five games, and he was quite prominent, sort of playing for them. And uh, uh, then he, he played for Australia in the cricket for about 10 years, captained them from 1900 to 1906, and uh, he was actually on a cigarette card, which uh, uh, it's got a little bit of a crease in this, but uh, he did a good job. He took the crease out, but he decided to go, go with the one with the crease because it gave it a little bit more character. But uh, Joe's a really interesting sort of character. He's, he's got this great big bushy beard, even bigger than that when you sort of see him sort of, uh, in some of the photos. And he, uh, he broke many sort of records in test cricket and he ch some rules were changed because of his batting. Um, he was the first left-hander to hit a, two centuries in a, in a, in a series. And um, the way he sort of hit the ball out of the park, um, it used to be five. They became six because uh, uh, because of the way he sort of batted. So uh, Gaul has got a connection with uh, with Joe, who went on. He went to Tasmania and he uh, became a politician later in life. He uh, he also had a uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of Rick Darling that played for Australia. Uh, Rick's his great nephew, and uh, it was interesting. I interviewed Rick, uh, Rick about two years ago. And he was telling me he had this photo at his grandfather's house of Joe Darling, which was the inspiration for him to want to play cricket for Australia, which I thought was quite a, a unique little story. <coughs> now, of course, uh, this is an interesting one. This is uh, Buff Lehman, uh, Australian coach, who um, was at the, uh, the Greyhounds with some of the Greyhound bunnies that used to sort of be there. Um, now, uh, he hit the winning runs in a, um, in a uh, World Cup final one year, and then the, the next one that Australia won, he took the catch to, to finish it. So he was involved in finishing two World Cup finals. Uh, he also hit centuries in Darwin and up north against Bangladesh. He's the only Australian player to do that as well, and uh, I'm sure everyone else knows uh, about his record. He played for Gawler Central Footy Club. He played reserves for Central District. He's a... Uh, He's a local sort of icon of, um, of Gawler. <coughs> of course, we've got a new icon of Gawler, um, Travis Head, who played uh, cricket and uh, football at South Gawler. He, uh, captain of South Australia now, and uh, then in the 2020, he bashed all those sixes to, to get the century, to get um, South Australia home in that uh, game, uh, I think it was New Year's Eve, where they had all the fireworks, and uh, absolute sort of uh, sens sensational kid again a product out of the, the Gawler system, so <coughs> so we can take our hat off to a lot of the various sporting stars. Oh, pardon me. Now another little story, uh, <coughs> we've got uh, Gawler Club, does anyone know what the Gawler Club in Gawler is? Where they play uh, billiards and snooker and, and eight ball, which is um, sort of like 125 years old or a few years older than that now. In 1926, I had a special guest that come, come to the club and played. His name was Walter Lindrum. Has anyone heard of Walter Lindrum? Yeah. So, if we go on to the next slide, that's the Gawler Club. 
with a few of the members. And this is Water Lindrum. Uh, we've got three photographs of water. But uh, in the Bunyip on December 24th, 1926, under the Billiards Extraordinaire, it talked about uh, water, the, the world record uh, holder with the break of uh, 1417. And uh, he went there and he, he gave an exhibition of fancy shots. And in one game against uh, Mr. Barclay, uh, in 19 minutes, Lindrum compiled 1,125 points against Mr. Barclay's 98. Uh, his best plate was 216, which he did in 12 minutes. Mm. So, uh, absolutely amazing uh, <coughs> to have someone of that standing in Gawler. Now we're going to do a little bit of a talk about uh, the pollies that come to Gawler and use sport as a little bit of a leverage or, or they have the love of sport. And uh, before we get to the first photo, I just want to talk about um, uh, John Howard came along uh, and uh, he was there when, uh, when the best person I think that ever sort of stood for, uh, for, for Gawler in politics, uh, Tom Zoic. He, um, he, um, Johnny came to uh, the Gawler Institute and he was presented with a book and a hat from the Sandy Creek Cricket Club. So there's uh, Johnny and Tommy sort of together. So, uh, so that was, uh, and of course, uh, Brian Sandler always gets his, you know, his mug and all these photographs as well. And sort of uh, just moving through there, like I said, Brian loves his sport. He'll, uh, he'll take up any sport to, uh, he loves it, he'll support sort of, he, that's the goal of ages, how he's gone on, he, tennis, softball, footy, basketball, you name it. He'll be in it. He, uh, he loves sport. He's a big supporter of sport in the area. We go to the next one, and we've got indoor bowls, and of course Nick Champion sort of uh, gets in on the act with the indoor bowls. He, uh, he obviously gets into a few shots here. Uh, then we go to the next one, which is a two down under. Uh, you've got Tony Piccolo, you've got uh, Mike Wayne, you've got uh, Kevin Rudd, and you've got Nick Champion. Sort of, uh, so they all come to Gawler, even the Queen came to Gawler. So, uh, so we sort of get it all, all here, and then uh, you go to the next one, and, uh, and there's a couple of guys happy to get their photo taken, and, and me taking a photo of a guy taking a photo of them too. too. So, uh, and then uh, John Dawkins, who's a big supporter of the baseball and the softball club, fire out the first pitch. And then, of course, um, we'll get Nick in again, uh, having a hit of the, the softball as well. So. Uh, the politicians love their sport here in Gawler, don't they? Well, they know that we love our sport, so, uh, so they get into it. Now, I'm just going to go through a few um, quick shots around uh, over the years, um, uh, which I've taken sort of in my role sort of, uh, as a sporting journalist. If you just want to go through these, um, Gawler races, um, the Gawler trots. I think this was the last uh, night of the trots before they uh, closed shop. And then we go to the next one. This is uh, Gawler Eagles soccer. And the next one, that's a team. Then uh, we go to the next one. Uh, Gawler High School won the, uh, the rugby championship at, um, for a couple of years uh, in the schools, schools knockout. Then you've got basketball at, um, at Star Plex. You've got KB and Ricky, who are two of the coaches for the Northern Region Sports Academy, which uh, Dow's uh, the president of that organisation. And then uh, another shot of the basketball. Of course, down at Williston, we've got the, the BMX racing. And that, that's when they had the Australian titles. At the, the rec centre, we've had boxing and a local uh, call of kid that's uh, into boxing. And now Trinity College have the athletes. This one here is a bit of uh, nepotism. This is my son, Sam, sort of competing for Trinity. Then we go on and we have the, the Tour of Gawler. Who's, that? Who's competing in the Tour of Gawler? Hands up there, everyone that's been in the Tour of Gawler. Tom and me, that's it. Oh, well. We are a lazy lot, aren't we? Um, then we go on to indoor bowls. That's a shield with all the premiers on it. And this is Lance, who? No, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, we, we know. But um, Now, I promised a, a mate of mine's going to come and have a little bit of a chat about playing um, sport here in the, uh, in the uh, 1960s. Uh, so I'd like uh, Robert Mahon to come up and have a little bit of a chat about uh, playing sport in Gawler in the 1960s. Now, um, Robin sort of played for South Gawler Footy Club. Uh, the, are you going to 
for the slide over. Oh, he's not. He's taking a photograph, so we're going to have to be hold it for a little bit. Just while they're getting the slides organised, uh, it's nice to be back in Gawler. Nice to see some friendly faces like Ray Hicks down here. I don't know, Roger Frisbee I've been talking to. Was Tommy Zorak, you're not a Gawler boy, are you, Tom? Yes, yeah, still here. Gawler man. All oh, right, and, and I never did meet Alf Skews. How are you, Alf? How are you going? On the football field, once or twice, I reckon, when you were playing for South, South Adelaide. Yeah. Nice to see you again. Well, now, Robin, uh, tell us a little story about how you got into playing Aussie Rules footy, mate. Well, I, uh, you probably notice that um, I speak a little bit funny. Well, that's a... Um, the, the, the Belfast accent that I had when I came out here in 1961, my family decided to emigrate. My brother Jerry, he came out first and uh, went to the Smithfield Hostel. And it wasn't long before, nine months after that, that we came. By then, Jerry had settled in 7th Street. 7th Street down there where Brian's already mentioned, Gawler Terrace was at the back of that. And I just want to clear something up. I didn't marry Kevin Sweeney. It was my sister that married Kevin Sweeney. <laughs> I want to be very clear about that. And I know Brian and, uh, and Kevin grew up together because they lived next door. Kevin had a younger brother called Gordon. And uh, that was the very first time I saw an Aussie Rules football. Uh, I used to nip down from 7th Street down the back and we'd start kicking on the, uh, the paddocks there alongside the river where the Gawler Three Day event used to be held. If you remember, that's where it was held for many years. Do I know this gentleman too? Uh, I just see faces that I think I know and I should have recognised them. I'll speak to you later and see who you are. <laughs> um, and so I started kicking this funny football with, with Gordon and it was rather strange because I grew up with a Ryan ball. And when you start kicking this egg-shaped ball, it really is a very big challenge. Now, the sad thing is that um, I was 16 when I came out to Australia, and um, I had no intentions of playing Aussie rules. I wanted to be an athlete. I really wanted to run. I wanted to be a, a decathlon uh, athlete, in fact. But when you come to Gawler in the early 60s, you had to go down to Adelaide to train, and that was simply impossible. You just, just couldn't do it. And so my brother and I, we went and we barracked for West Adelaide. Now, can any of you remember the West Adelaide Football Club in the early 60s? They were a very good team. And why did we barrack for them? I'll give you some of the names and you'll probably twig. Curley, yeah. Ryan, yeah. Hogan, Walsh, O'Driscoll. Do you get the idea? It was almost chock-a-block full of Catholic Irishmen. So my brother and I, we went and we, played, we watched West Adelaide for a couple of seasons, which meant, Robert, that by the time I was 18, or getting on for 18, that I decided, well, I'm going to have a bit of a lash at this funny-shaped football and Aussie rules. And uh, I, I used to go to the St. Peter and Paul Church there, right on the Mass, and you remember a guy called Tom Gleeson? Mm -hmm. Tom Gleeson actually became a late vocations priest in, in, in his later years, but he played uh, centre for South Gore. And uh, I had already decided I was going to play for Gawler Centrals because South Gawler were a pretty big strength in those early 60 years. And I thought, well, if I'm going to get a game, I'll go and join up with Gawler Centrals. And uh, Tom got the hear of that, collared me one morning after Mass and said, sorry, you're fronting up the training on Tuesday night at South Gawler. And in fact, I said, I'll look after you. And he really did. He, he said, I'll look after you if you come and play there. And I went down and um, a bloke called Marty Bartholomew was coaching him, I think, in those years. And... Um, I played in the B grade, first couple of games in the B grade, and the Fools, after a couple of games in the B grade, they put me in their A grade team. And, you know, really, true story, the very first game I played, I kicked the ball, I think, probably two or three times the wrong way. I just got the ball and thought, well, I'll just go and do I didn't know the rules. Um, uh, Ray, you probably remember this guy, a bloke called Ken Rogers, used to work in the Gawler Post Office. Those of you who've got good memories, he was a local telegraphist. And Ken gave me my very first lesson in Aussie rules. Uh, he said, look, he said, I know they haven't t told you very much except, you know, here's the ball and you know, here's your position on the football field. You're going to be playing centre wing in the B grade. Uh, when they're attacking, you defend. And when you're defending, you attack. And, you know, really over the years, I don't think I've heard a better description of how you play the wing in an Aussie rules game since. Because that's what I did. Any time that the ball was in our defence, I attacked and the other way around. I must have did all right because I, um, we played uh, Gawler Centrals in the A grade grand final in 1963. That was my first year. Uh, and I was very pleased because Tommy Gleason was centre, I was in one wing, and the bloke in the other wing for Gawler Centrals was a guy called Sonny Morey. 
Those of you who remember football will know that Sonny is as good a wingman as you'd ever see in your life. It happened to be Sonny's last year in, in, uh, in Gawler because the next year Central District football team was created and Sonny went down there and I kept on playing after that probably about four or five years for the Great South Gawler football team which I really enjoyed doing by the way. They're a great club. Sorry, Rob, I've talked yeah, to the okay. country. Then, uh, then, of course, Robert went down uh, 1968 to Central, so you won the best and fairest. And, uh... Uh, yes, yeah. After, um, uh, it's interesting when you play Aussie rules, because um, Alf grew up with it. And by the way, Brian, Alf and I never kicked in Gawler Terrace. I don't think Alf wouldn't have kicked me at football with me in those years, because I, uh, I wouldn't have had a clue what to do. But um, certainly in latter years, um, I admired Alf's, Alf's football, a very fast footballer. And Alf, I would love to have, one, one thing I really would have liked to have seen in my time was you and Peter Vivian lining up and seeing who actually could, could cover the distance fastest. Uh, I, I think maybe you might have been a bit quicker than Peter, but don't tell him that. <laughs> and just as an aside, I guess, apart from football, it's, it's nice to tell other little bits of information. Um, I'm the reason Peter Vivian lives in Gore, you might like to know. Peter's a Springton boy, came from Eden Valley, Springton Way. And uh, he and Rocky, when they first got married, just down there, not very far down from where Peter's uh, business is, uh, there's a set of flats. And Rocky and Peter um, moved in there because it was closer to Elizabeth Oval and Springton. And I'd already built a house up in Cheek Avenue when there was first, I think it was the Koshal, Koshal Estate it was called. I think it was the Koshal Frisian Farm was up there. And I was one of the first people to buy a block of land in Cheek Avenue. And so I'd already built a house and Peter was looking around to see what he was going to do. And uh, I said, why don't you buy a block of land up on the hill, up, up where I'm living? And he did. And so Peter settled in Gawler. So if any of you like Peter or don't like him, I'm the reason that he, that he lives here. <laughs> He's a good man, though, Milky. And of course, you went on and you played sort of state football with the champ in the, in the, uh, the old uh, championship sort of series in 72. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Um, Centrals in those years was a pretty good club to go to. And I have to say, I really didn't want to go down to Centrals. But I wanted to play for West Adelaide. But of course, uh, you know why. And, uh, but of course, you're tied to singles. And uh, when I decided, look, I'm going to give this South Gawler, I didn't really want to leave. But I guess at some stage in your life, I was nearly 24, I suppose, 23, 24. And I thought, well, I'm probably ready now to go and have one go at it because you really have to have a try, don't you? And I went down there, and the thing that I was really impressed about was they were really, really hungry to get on and do something really good. They wanted to win a premiership, they did, just didn't want to make up the numbers being a new team. In all those early years, we, we tried very hard to see if we could get a team together, and eventually, you know, in the early 70s, Centrals had a jolly good go at nearly making a couple of grand finals. Just missed out. Tommy, we probably should have played them both of them, I think. We won't go through that now. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, um, I played in the... Uh, the last carnival that was ever held, remember they used to hold interstate carnivals? Mm -hmm. uh, they had them every two or three years, every three years I think then. Four years was it Tom? And uh, so you went away somewhere, I went to Perth and played in the last carnival ever conducted. Uh, and what happens was you played uh, Tasmania, you played Victoria and you played Western Australia. They were the four teams that played and you played for the Australian Championships. And uh, I remember playing against the Vicks and uh, the Rovers in the game I played, the first game I played against Victoria, the Rovers were a bloke called Kevin Bartlett, not a bad footballer, a bloke called Rossi Smith, who also wasn't a bad footballer, and uh, Lee Matthews, he was the other Rover. So I walked out into the football field, I ran out and said, what am I doing here? You know, but you know, as you do, you go out and you try your very best, and uh, I really enjoyed playing uh, the state games I played. Uh, I made a mistake though in the very first game, went out, went up to the back pocket player, a bloke called Kevin Sheedy, mm -hmm. and something I never did before, I've never done since. I went out and I stuck my hand out to shake his hand and he went boop. So I started off the game with a black eye, and it was really him saying to me, welcome to state football, Robert. I thought, okay, it's going to be tough. So. I was just getting on to a couple of other sports that you played in Gawler. You, you played badminton. Where, where did you play badminton? Uh, badminton was played under the Gawler and um, in, in, in the grandstand at the, at the Gawler Oval. In there, in that great big space, there was a gymnasium held there during the week or on Friday nights. I used to go along and do little somersaults and handsprings and enjoyed myself there. And a bit of table tennis. Played a bit of table tennis in there. But they also had a badminton club. 
And I worked for a company in those years, before I joined the post office with Ray, called Hockey and Man. Remember Hockey and Man? Yep. Carpenters and joiners out at Williston. And Wind. Glenn Mann was a badminton player. And Glenn uh, said, well, come along, you know, you play tennis, come along and uh, have a go at the badminton. So I went along and uh, had a bit of a bit of a swish with the badminton. So it was not a bad game. Good for your reflexes. And you played table tennis out at Kangaroo Flat? Played for Kangaroo Flat out there, yes. The caller was a very good table tennis association, by G. Uh, there was, you know, good players out at Reeves Plains and Kangaroo Flat and there's young people called match horses, if anybody remember them. Really, really good table tennis players. And the Thomases out at Reeves Plains, they were really excellent table tennis players. So I really enjoyed that too. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we've spoken about South Gordon as your oh. first team back in uh, 1963. And then um, we'll go on to tennis now, the, the next one. Yeah, the bloke down the front there. Uh, just, just, if you just go back to that photograph again, there's an interesting... Uh, the, the, the lad sitting down second from the right is a bloke called Bobby Edmonds. Anyone remember Bobby Edmonds? And his, his, his father, Stan Edmonds, was a good footballer and baller. But Bobby not only was a really good footballer, because he went down with Sonny Maury the same year, he was the youngest league footballer off his era ever to play league football, Bob Edmonds. And he was a jolly good tennis player too. As was the guy at the other side, in second from the left, a bloke called Peter Clark. He had two brothers too, Dean Clark and Des yes, Clark. Yeah. Now, Des Clark was the country championship more, champion more than once in tennis. He was an excellent tennis player. Peter was a good footballer. He would have kicked 100 goals pretty well most of the years I played. And Tom Gleason's the second row back, second one in from the right. That was a jolly good team. They carried me the whole year. You know, I didn't have a clue what I was doing that whole first season. <laughs> I had one rule. I had one rule. Alf, you'll appreciate this. When I first started playing Aussie rules, no skills whatsoever, because you never played Colts. You didn't know what, what end of the ball was up. And uh, I figured that um, one thing I'm going to do, if I've got the football, doesn't matter how good your skills are, you're stuffed. And so what I did, I went out and I made sure I got hold of that football as often as I could, because you couldn't make me look silly then, so that was my style. Now, of course, you, you played tennis, you were a pretty handy player. You made the state country team a couple of times. and. Uh, just tell us a little bit about this photograph that you were involved in. Uh, you actually, actually tennis was my favourite sport, if, if the truth be told. I rather enjoyed playing tennis. Did anyone here know a bloke called Bob Symes? I think he's Nobby Symes. Is he Nobby Symes' brother or his cousin? Not sure. Cousin, I think. But Bob and I, we played a lot of tennis together. We played tennis you know, day in, day out. He's not in this photograph. There's a few people of interest in that photograph, though. Um, the big tall guy at the very back, that's a bloke called Trevor Stanton. Yep. And Trevor was uh, Central District's captain in two years, I reckon? 1970. 1970. The big teacher was you know, a jolly good tennis player. One thing you never did with a teach, you never tried to toss him at net, because he had no show. Uh, the, another interesting person there is, see the second girl in on the right? Her name is Heather Jones. She came from out Lamaroo way to Gawler. Uh, Sorry? Hi, hi. Oh, you do know. Yes. And uh, she, uh, of course, is uh, Heather Matner these days, and uh, Marty Matner's uh, mother. Yes. You didn't know that. So, there you go. So that's Heather Jones. She came to Gawler, and she was a fine tennis player. Uh, the lady here was a, a Des Clark's wife on the left-hand side in front of me, and the other two ladies are Malala tennis players. Now, I think both those teams probably won the country championships that year, but our ladies in Gaul, or the lady tennis players, were superb. Malala Tennis Club, one year, went against the Gawler District Tennis Association, and they put their own team in the country carnival. This is the Malala ladies tennis team put themselves in the country carnival, and they got actually um, banned from playing tennis in Gawler for that reason, but they had to reinstate them because they actually won the country championship the year they went down as a club. It's hard to figure, isn't it? You know, these are the best tennis players in, in the state, and yet one club, the ladies, went down there and won the country championship. Lady on the end is a lady called Faye Dunstan. She was Faye Griffiths. And the, the bloke standing next to me at the back, John Griffiths. Bloody good footballer and a bloody good tennis player. Excellent, in fact. That's so just an interesting little uh, photograph, that one. Well, thank you very much, Bob, and a little round of applause for Bob. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to finish off with a little bit about the, uh, the Olympics are starting, so I thought uh, 
what better um, what better little thing to end up with there except for the Olympics? And of course, uh, Gawler's most famous Olympian is um, Lisa Sorry. Martin at the time, Lisa O'Day, who uh, then became Lisa Ondiecki. But when she won the silver medal at the '88 Olympics, it was uh, Lisa Martin. And uh, we showed a slide before about the uh, the tour of Gawler, and uh, I remember they used to handicap everyone from that race, and they used to to a 10k run around the, the Gawler Oval on the sand, a handicap race, which was for the Lisa Martin handicap. So, um, and of course, her, her parents are well known for athletics in, the, in Gawler as well. So, uh, Lisa sort of probably with uh, Buff Lehman, the two iconic sporting stars over the last 50 years in, in Gawler. Uh, just sort of uh, moving on a little bit. Uh, Jack Bowbridge, of course, won the silver medal uh, at the last Olympics, and he was in. This was in uh, 2008 in uh, Beijing, and um, he was in the, uh, the team pursuit for cycling. And uh, he's uh, he's in it again, and uh, he also competed in the Tour Down Under and signed in at Gawler. That's uh, Jack uh, sort of signing in at Gawler, uh, but this year he's in it, and there's a uh, his next door neighbour, Callum Scotson, is in the team as well. So. This is Callum, who, who got his grounding in the BMX at uh, Williston, um, and his brother, his older brother Miles, and and him and uh, Callum won the uh, won the, uh, the world titles uh, this year. And uh, Miles is on the left, and he's going as a um, as a reserve for the team. And uh, a young Trinity girl, uh, Chelsea James, who's um, going as a long jump, and she's an interesting story because. Uh, she competed in heptathlon for uh, a number of years, and then she gave, gave the sport away for up to nine years, and then she uh, returned, and, um, and now she's made the Olympics as a long jumper, which I think is absolutely amazing. Uh, and then, um, just getting to uh, the last little bit here, this is um, Trinity teachers. You've got Sean Carlin, uh, who's an Olympian. Uh, you've got Richard Bednall, who's uh, the sports master at Trinity for, for many years. And, uh, of course, Neil Fuller, who uh, was, uh, won many gold medals in the Paralympics. And, um, and Sean sort of uh, uh, won two gold medals at the Commonwealth Games and, um, and is an Olympian. Do you mind just coming up and talking for a few minutes just on your experience in the Olympics, Sean? Yeah. Sean Carlin, have a, have a fun. So Sean, do you, do you remember when that photo was taken? Yeah, well that was uh, Knockout Athletics Championships. Uh, we used to go to that fairly often and, and did pretty well. So I'm not, what year was that? It was about 2007, I think. That's in Melbourne, isn't it? Or Brisbane? Um, <laughs> well, so you're, you're good with history, but not with geography. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, Trillian had some fairly decent coaches in that time. So, uh, Olympics, mate. Tell us about your first Olympics. Our first Olympics was Barcelona, um, and so in Spain, uh, I tried out for uh, 88 and uh, didn't make it, um, and then went to Comms Games in 90, um, and then was lucky enough to get selected for Barcelona in 92. And you finished 8th, but there's a little story, you weren't in the final though, what happened there? No, no, I actually finished, well, I officially am 8th, but on the day I actually finished 9th, um, and in uh, track and field, in the field events, you get... Uh, you have a qualifying round, so you get three throws or three jumps uh, in that round, and if you get through that, you get into the final. Uh, but the final actually has two rounds, and again, there's uh, two uh, two rounds of three. So you have to be if you in the top eight after the first three rounds, you get another three attempts. Um, and unfortunately, on that day, at the end of the, those three rounds, I was ninth, and so I missed out on getting the final three throws by by that one place. Uh, I guess the story is after the American guy, Judd Logan, who was fourth, actually ended up getting uh, caught on drugs, and so uh, he got uh, disqualified and I got elevated to the eighth spot, but unfortunately, uh, you know, it would have been nice to get those last three throws and, and have another crack. Still top eight in the world, that's pretty good. Yeah, look, at, at the t I mean, um, you know, track and field is a little bit different than your, your normal team sports, and so my aim uh, in athletics was I really wanted to obviously go to the Olympics, but you, you want to go to that major championship and be able to perform at your best. And uh, that was probably, 
I think my best competition that I had at international level. Um, that was I threw uh, just over 76 metres, and that was at the time my second best throw ever, and I, and I really was in good shape and throwing well. And so I was disappointed not to have those next three rounds because that, that's I guess the thing you just never know. I mean in terms of throwing a PB, and that was my aim. I wanted to go to the biggest stage and be able to perform at my best when it counted. Um, and Barcelona was probably, that was what I'd say, was my second best ever. So I didn't quite get there, um, but I was pretty happy with that competition. And what about the atmosphere of the Olympic Games? As an athlete, what, what is that like? It's, it's, it's just massive. Like, it's just a big carnival. I mean, it's, um, it's the crowds are different on different days, like qualifying rounds, uh, for us, we're in the morning, and there was much smaller crowds. But when you went out to compete for the final, that stadium there was, was full. Um, and so it's just, you know, when you when you come from competing in South Australia, where you'd go to the athletics, there might be a few hundred people, or uh, even at national championships, never never a big sport. Um, to walk into that stadium with all those people uh, was was a great experience. And just being there um, in the village. Um, and being around all those other athletes and being part of that big show is, is, is just exciting. And, and the other, Sharon was there at the time, um, and also, uh, so I found out then that um, we were going to have our first child too, so... She didn't tell you to after you competed? No, she didn't. <laughs> um, so Sharon found out before I went away, but she didn't want to tell me in case that sort of distracted me from, um, from what I was there to do. And you were there in uh, 96 in Atlanta, obviously not as, you didn't do as well then, but what was that experience like? Atlanta was uh, certainly, from a competition point of view, disappointing. Uh, I didn't compete very well, and um, I'd had from sort of Barcelona through to uh, to Atlanta, I had um, a split with my coach, uh, who was at the time I had like Peter Brebner was my my hammer coach, my hammer throwing coach, and he he was a 400 metre hurdle in his day. Um, um, he's now a judge actually, but he was a great. He learned. I mean, he was not a great hammer thrower. Um, but he was a really uh, great scholar and he really learnt that event and he did a lot of work. So technically when I was with him I was getting better and better. We did a lot of travelling overseas and worked with good coaches. Um, for different reasons we went our own way and the guy who was doing my strength conditioning was also a, a, a very good throws coach and so we worked together and to be you know, looking back reflecting I just wasn't, conditioning wise I was probably in my best shape ever. I was strong and fast and all those things but I just I just wasn't quite there technically, and um, and in hammer throwing is such a rhythmical sport, um, and I just I just wasn't in, in that sort of shape to throw as far as I needed to. And of course, uh, your son sort of uh, represented Australia at, uh, at basketball as a, a junior. Sort of uh, it would have been good <laughs> if he managed to uh, follow your footsteps and make the Olympics, but not quite sort of uh, at that level. Well, look, Daniel uh, competed in the under 17 World Championships over in Germany. Um, and did very well, and uh, so he's, I mean, you know, basketball's a, a tough sport, um, and Australia have done very well, and are doing very well. I mean, the calibre of our women's team, they've been medalists for, for many Olympics, and our men hopefully have a chance this, this year. Um, he went off to America to play basketball over there, and he's come back last year. He was developing a play with the 36ers at the moment. He doesn't have any uh, contracts with NBL. That's what he'd like to do, um, and so... He's just got to keep trying. I mean, he, he's a very good basketballer and worked very, very hard. So um, he looks pretty young there, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> looks a bit different now with all the hair and the beard. But um, Did you have some hair when you competed? Oh, no, I've never had hair. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank you very much for that, uh, Sean. All the best, mate. Thank you. <laughs> well, that concludes um, the presentation. I, I hope there's something there for everyone. And, um, uh, thank you very much. Cheers. Cool.